Hello again everyone. Welcome to the Adult Sunday School lesson for September the 15th, 2024. It's another New Testament lesson from the Gospel of Mark. This one entitled Questions and Directions. The Gospel of Mark is our featured gospel all during the month of September. And uh, you recall that uh, this is the year B in the lexicon or in the uh, lectionary series of three-year cycle A, B, and C years. During the B year, we focus on the Gospel of Mark. The September lessons are entitled Lesson Plans, and they are all based on Mark's Gospel, in which we look at some of the lesser understood or more difficult sayings of Jesus. First Sunday, we saw commandments and traditions. Last Sunday, it was crumbs and crowds. Today, it's questions and directions. Next week, first and last, and then the, the last lesson in the series is entitled, For Us and Against Us. The sayings of Jesus are so important. They represent the foundation of the Gospels, really. And so we need to look at these scriptures and uh, be sure that we open our hearts and minds to what these challenging sayings of Jesus, which in one sense are quite familiar, but in another sense they are difficult for us to understand and apply. So uh, these lessons are, uh, are so beneficial and helpful to us. Today, questions and directions. We remind ourselves that uh, the traditional author of the Gospel of Mark is a young man, pictured in this icon, a young man, even though he had a, a beard, you can see his, his, he still has dark hair. He is much younger than some of the other New Testament figures that we remember. He was the companion of the Apostle Peter. So he listened to many sermons and teachings from the Apostle Peter. And perhaps many of those uh, have made it into the gospel that bears Mark's name. One thing I like about Mark's gospel is that it is action-packed. It's not a lot of fluff or... Uh, not a lot of padding, but it's action verb after action verb. Jesus said this, Jesus did this. We believe that Mark is the first narrative gospel or, or story of the life of Jesus. Though certainly there may have been fragments and uh, collections of his sayings in existence prior to the writing of this gospel, perhaps around A.D. 70. It's interesting to note that uh, if, if we didn't have the standalone Gospel of Mark, we would still have virtually all of the Gospel of Mark because it's included into the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. And so this uh, trying to explain the similarities between Matthew, Mark, and Luke uh, is a complex issue and problem. Many people spend a lifetime studying it. The simplest... Uh, explanation that I've been able to come across is that uh, Mark wrote first and both Matthew and Luke used Mark's gospel for constructing their own gospel. They, they uh, put a, their own editorial spin on the gospel that is slightly different than Mark's understanding. Mark is the shortest of the gospels. It uh, features a narrative device called uh, sandwiches where uh, a story is duplicated or repeated in layers. And a chief characteristic of Mark's gospel that we do not see in the other gospels is Jesus' admonition for his followers to remain silent, not to spread word of uh, the miracles he was performing. I go back to the symbols for the evangelists. 
Matthew the lion, Mark the man, although sometimes those are reversed. About half the time, Mark is seen as a lion and Matthew a man, but uh, either a, a man or a lion symbolizes Mark. Luke is always a sacrificial animal and John is always an eagle. So, are there any expectations of those who follow Jesus? In other words, it's pretty easy to join a church. We just walk down an aisle and make a profession of faith. But uh, that doesn't end. We, we have expectations as followers. We need to be good followers to support the church, to, to not speak negatively towards uh, other believers, to try to get along. So there are, maybe there are lots of expectations for followers of Jesus. Uh, sometimes we wear special clothing or wardrobe, uh, necklaces with a cross on it, you know, throughout uh, history, sometimes uh, distinctive garb has pointed to this being a follower of the Lord. Typically, we bring gifts and offerings. That's an expectation as we uh, seek to follow the Lord. Maybe there are rituals or behaviors that we should engage in. Sometimes we are required to be baptized or uh, to express our belief in, in many ways. Certainly there are behavioral expectations. We're called upon to put away past sinful behaviors and uh, uh, walk in a new way of life that keeps the commandments. So there are lots of expectations for followers of Jesus. In today's text, we're going to see described the required actions of followers of Jesus which comes from a hard saying of Jesus. It's hard for us to understand it, and it's also hard for us to live up to it. And that saying is to take up your cross. That is the expectation. We can read that as a uh, metaphor or read it as an allegory, but probably the first followers of Jesus didn't take it as a figure of speech. They took it as a direct command, a concrete admonition to take up a cross. And they would know what that meant because they would be witnesses to crucifixion in the Roman Empire. And they knew that that meant uh, going to your death for a cause. Jesus' command to take up your cross can be seen as a categorical command to die to self, but be open to the gospel. Easy words to say, hard words to incorporate into our life. I like this map because it outlines some Gentile territories around uh, the Jewish strongholds there in the Galilee and down in Jerusalem. Today we're dealing with an area called Caesarea Philippi, which is over here to the east of Tyre. Last week's lessons, the Syrophoenician woman and uh, the blind man who was cured at Decapolis. These were also Gentile territories. So Jesus is still outside the comfort zone of, of uh, his, uh, the religion that he grew up in, uh, practicing Judaism. He's dealing with Gentile territories and pagan influence and pagan culture. So let's look at these questions that Jesus is asking. These verses 27 through 30 of Mark 8 say, Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi. And on the way, he asked his disciples, Who do people say I am? They answered him, John the Baptist and others, Elijah and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say that I am? Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. 
and he sternly ordered them not to tell anyone about him. Up to this point in the gospel narrative, Jesus has been asked questions. But now, he asks some rather hard questions. Starts off with an easy one. Who do other people say that I am? That, that, that would be a, a simple one to understand and perhaps a simple one to ask her, to answer. Who do other people say I am? Not necessarily you, but who have you heard that I am? Then there's a more difficult and personal question, and that is, well, who do you say that I am? Peter, who's not reluctant to speak up in these situations, speaks up with an amazing declaration. He says, you are the Messiah. None of these other answers had anything to do with Messiah, although uh, there, there may be a messianic thread to some of them, like Elijah was supposed to come before the advent of the end times. And so, uh, but anyway, Jesus is in good company where they're, they're associating the works of Jesus with these amazing and powerful spiritual figures. And then when he asks that same question to the disciples, Peter chimes in, well, no, you're none of those. You are the Messiah. What's the vibe on the street? Jesus was interested in knowing what, uh, what others were saying. Jesus does not correct Peter or say that he's wrong in calling him the Messiah. But he does admonish the disciples to keep this fact quiet. He commands them. This is part of that messianic secret motif that we see in the Gospel of Mark that is peculiar to the Gospel of Mark. It, we don't find this same situation in the other Gospels. We said in the last week's text, Jesus asked the crowds to keep his healing miracles a secret. And now this week, we see Jesus ask his disciples also to remain silent about the Messiahship. This has led some to speculate that perhaps Jesus was considering what he needed to do. Was it time for him to declare openly that he was the Messiah, then go to Jerusalem and experience what was waiting for him there, or did he need to think about it some more, or, or do some more ministry among the peoples? Who knows? Mark does not tell us exactly why Jesus wanted to keep the messianic secret. But he does ask the disciples, who do you say that I am? He puts a lot of weight in how he was uh, viewed by his close friends and disciples. So, from the text, there's an emphatic question, but who do you say that I am? In other words, there are some words in the text that emphasize Jesus wants to, to know specifically about uh, what, the, what the disciples think. There must have been lots of speculation about Jesus' identity and his role among the crowds and even among the disciples. They probably did not have a mature understanding of Jesus' role as Messiah. So asking these questions would help them to, uh, to concentrate and uh, uh, limit their thinking, pointing them in the right direction. But common ideas of Messiah were far removed from Jesus' own conception of what his mission as Messiah might be. I believe this may be some of the reason for the messianic secret that if, had Jesus said, yes, I'm the Messiah outright, there would have been a thousand different interpretations about what that might mean. And none of them would relate to exactly how Jesus was behaving and the ministry he was providing. The, those who were looking for a Messiah were looking for a conquering 
victorious king like David, who was going to be a political hero and throw off the yoke of Roman oppression. Uh, it, it, clearly they were looking for an earthly, powerful uh, prince or, or king. And that's not the type of Messiah that Jesus was bringing to the world. There is a, a pronoun that's quite emphatic in the text that's not needed that duplicates the sense of the question Jesus asking. So it's not just using a verb to say, who, did, who do you say I am? But he puts a, an emphasizing pronoun in the text to have them concentrate. I don't care about other people. I want to know what you think. The crowds did not rightly understand Jesus' role, but maybe the disciples did. And certainly we get an inkling that Peter had a strong idea that Jesus was the Messiah. And he makes this bold declaration here. The parallel uh, section of this in Matthew's Gospel uh, goes on it in some length about uh, Jesus praising Peter for his insight and offering him the keys to the kingdom. In other words, the, he's going to be foremost among the disciples. And the, uh, our Catholic friends point to that scripture and say that uh, Peter was perhaps the first believer, the first uh, leader of the church, the first pope, because uh, Jesus recognized and uh, rewarded Peter for his insight. Well, let's, let's continue the story. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are set in your mind not on divine things, but on human things. So, perhaps Jesus asks his disciples to remain quiet because of the differing expectations of Messiah that the crowds were, were mentioning and even that may be in their own minds. Rather than a conquering king and miracle worker, Jesus describes Messiah as a suffering servant who's going to be put to death. They would be flabbergasted by that. No definition or job description for Messiah would include any of what Jesus is saying here. So Peter says to Jesus privately, Are you crazy? That's not what we signed up for. Well, not exactly these words, but words to that effect. He, he just could not imagine that uh, the type of Messiah that Jesus was describing. But then Jesus openly rebukes Peter and all the disciples in harsh terms evoking the image of Satan clouding their minds. Even in the parallel passage of this in Matthew, even though uh, Jesus gives the keys of the kingdom to Peter, he also tells, tells him that he's, he's acting like Satan and needs to get behind him. So there's an instant rebuke to, to Peter's confession as well. So it's not all positive. They may have grasped some of the truth of what Jesus' Messiahship is, but they didn't grasp all of it fully. The idea of a Messiah who suffers and dies would have been incomprehensible to the disciples. Messiah meant a victorious, ideal ruler, a new David, not a suffering servant. So that's why they were, Peter was trying to straighten out Jesus on uh, what this Messiahship really meant. But I get the sense that Jesus uses these private uh, minutes for teaching and develops a camaraderie or understanding among the apostles that was 
quite more detailed and uh, intense than other followers uh, would have had. So, let us continue the story with these concluding verses. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any wish to come after me, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. Wow. So Jesus calls the crowds and the disciples together for this important teaching. It's not just for the disciples, but it's for every would-be follower. Christian faith is one of self-denial and sacrifice. The cross, taking up the cross, means death, literally. Though there is a spiritual aspect to this command, here in Mark's text, it's clear that Jesus has in mind a literal sacrifice of life. It's, he's calling for them to do away with their current existence and follow him in a, uh, a fully dedicated, sacrificial way. There are parallel texts to this in the other Gospels, which mention taking up the cross daily, which some have taken to be a softening of Jesus' command, what's sometimes called the domestication of the gospel. One of the characteristics of Mark's gospel, he gives it rough and ready, categorical, without softening the demand. These are hard teachings and not everybody would be willing to put away their life and sacrifice uh, their life to, uh, to the gospel or to the kingdom of God. So as the church spread, some say that this command of Jesus had to be softened in order for people to latch on to it and, and follow it. So you have various spiritual uh, interpretations of this, such as take up your cross daily. Well, you don't die daily. I mean, you can be committed to a lifestyle every day, but you're not literally crucified, put to death every day. This, So, you know trying to calibrate what Jesus really means by this saying has been difficult. Started with the very first generation of believers. It's continued throughout the history of the church. And even today there are different interpretations about what being a Christian is. Whether it's a call to sacrifice or is it a call to, uh, to benefit and prosperity. You know, there are those who preach a prosperity gospel that God wants you rich. And uh, if you're not rich, it's because you don't have faith. This doesn't seem to be what Jesus is talking about here. He's talking about a sacrificing your life for the kingdom of God, not getting anything out of it yourself. So that's why these sayings are, are difficult to understand and implement. And even in today's text, I sense that there's some domestication because... Uh, in this command, Jesus says, whoever loses their life for my sake will save it. But then there's a parenthetical statement here. You could lose your life for my sake and also for the sake of the gospel. So this indicates that uh, maybe there is some uh, uh, historical teaching to this text that, that later becomes a part of the Christian mission. You know, the, uh, it's only the first generation of disciples who would have been able to give their life literally for Jesus. But all of us who have become Christians after that could devote our life 
to the gospel in some sense that would be different than devoting our life to the historical Jesus. So uh, maybe it's a necessary addition to this command. But uh, I hope that you can see in these texts how uh, these hard sayings are sometimes softened over time uh, in order for them to gain traction. So today we read these words allegorically or as a metaphor, but to Jesus' original hearers, they would have taken the words literally and concretely because they know what taking up a cross is. It's not fun and games. It's not a mental exercise. It's, uh, it's death. Cross meant suffering and death. No wonder some would turn away from Jesus, not be open to that, and no wonder even today that uh, the Christian message is not uh, 100% uh, absorbed or assumed by followers. Some would even be ashamed of Jesus. They would not want to be called Christians because uh, Jesus the criminal was put to death, and uh, that would be shameful to be to be called a criminal and and die a uh, uh, a painful sinner's death that way. Many people then, as today, would rather have the world's riches than an innocent soul. That's the trade-off, and it's really a hard bargain. You know, uh, it's almost a cliche that uh, people would sell their soul for 20 years of prosperity, and many works of fiction, movies, the Daniel and the, the Devil and Daniel Webster's, or uh, the Legend of Faust. Others who make a deal with the devil and they don't care about the, an innocent soul but give me blessings and wealth today and I don't care what happens tomorrow. Uh, that's just the opposite of what Jesus was teaching with this difficult saying. The Baptist commentator says the following, In Mark's gospel, Jesus repeated three times the warning about his death and quite plainly, this is one of the times in our text today. There are two other occasions in Mark's gospel that he says his messiahship will entail suffering and death. Yet the disciples still had trouble reconciling their ideas of Messiah with Jesus' commands and Jesus' ideas about Messiah. The way of the cross bestows no earthly benefits but requires an absolute commitment even to death. So the Baptist commentator doesn't think much of the prosperity gospel. And uh, I must agree with him in that regard. I do not either. Bishop Barclay says, A person may sacrifice eternity for the moment. We would be saved from all sorts of mistakes if we always looked at things in light of eternity. Many a thing is pleasant in the moment, but ruinous in the long run. The test of seeing things as God sees them will keep us from spending life on the things that lose the soul. Isn't that a tragedy or a good way to put the decadent lifestyle? Spending life on things that lose the soul, which is a direct comment on Jesus' idea. What good is it to gain the whole world but lose our soul? And we can fall victim to that if we have a misplaced perspective. So what are the issues today? Well, like the disciple Peter, we're not capable of understanding all spiritual truths. We get a piece of it, I'm certain of that, and I'm sure that Peter had a partial understanding of Jesus' mission and what his idea of Messiah is, but even after his insight, Jesus needed to rebuke him. And uh, I take that as a cautionary tale when we get so smug thinking that we have all spiritual truth figured out, uh, we're probably setting ourselves up for a failure. Our call to faith is necessarily clothed in our personal understandings, which might or not might not be fully accurate. 
That's another way of saying we don't have complete insight. We see through a glass darkly. We understand in part. So we should remain open to the idea of new truth coming in or that our spiritual life would experience new understanding and, and be open to that. It's likely we downplay the commitment required and overestimate our level of faithfulness. I don't say it's likely in my case. It's certainly so in my case. It seems that Jesus' command today is for total commitment unto death, suffering and death. And uh, I've softened that up and domesticated it quite a bit in the concessions I make to it. And as I examine my own life, sometimes I don't see how, how dark uh, my own life can be. And uh, my level of faithfulness may be better than it was at one point in my life, but I still have a ways to go when it comes to uh, the spiritual pilgrimage. I think it's wise for us to understand that take up your cross is a call to a life of sacrifice and death, not to ease and prosperity. That's why these are difficult sayings. It would be much easier if the spiritual life promised us no, no questions, no problems, everything we would need. I think just the opposite is the case. So thank you for joining me today. Again, do not take me too seriously, particularly when I'm editorializing or speculating about aspects of the Scripture. But uh, I do ask you to study the Scripture and take it most seriously because it deserves our best effort and study. Uh, these lessons I put together represent my own point of view, which is an amateur layperson's point of view. I could be overlooking very serious aspects or uh, misinterpreting uh, clear teachings, and I, I don't seek to do that. So you'd be wise to enter a, uh, a discussion group yourself so that you could uh, hear other points of view and share your own point of view. I ask you to remember the prayer concerns of our church, which are communicated to us in our worship time and uh, daily in the emails that we receive. And I'll see you next week as we continue our study in the Gospel of Mark. And uh, again, these sessions would not occur if it weren't for the excellent production and direction and technical support of Daryl Elster, our Minister of Technology and Education. Thank you, Daryl. Until next week, I will say goodbye.